If you are new to the channel and do happen to gain something out of this content, smash that like and subscribe button. And don't forget to turn on that notification bell so that you can be one of the first to know when a new episode has been released. When the words man-eating lions are uttered, it's typically the famous Lions of Savo that come to the forefront of most minds. I mean heck, with books and a legitimate Hollywood movie starring Val Kilmer and Michael Douglas made about it, this doesn't really come as a surprise. A lesser known fact is that man-eating lions have wreaked havoc in various parts of Africa since Europeans first began writing about African game in the mid to late 1800s. The big questions, however, were always, why? Why was it that not just one or two, but whole prides of lions would develop such taste for human flesh? And what was it that caused such a shift in their choice of prey? Once a lion discovers that it can kill people, it's going to continue killing people until it's killed. The common assumptions prior to the publication of Colonel John Patterson's famous Savo Lions book back in 1907 were that lions classified as man-eaters were always poor, broken down, tooth-worn, crippled brutes who ate people for a living, either due to old age or injury. It wasn't until the Savo Lions book was first published that game hunters and researchers would realize that although an aged or injured lion may very well be a strong candidate for an attack on a human, most people preying lions were in general quite healthy and were observed to be more than fit to pursue their normal prey items. And speaking of prey items, a series of brutal lion attacks due to a sudden drop in their numbers once spelled disaster for a large number of villagers that had been living in close proximity to lion territory. This particular rampage occurred between 1932 to 1947, a period of time when many villagers in parts of southern Tanzania lived in daily fear of being attacked by lions. It was specifically a pride of 15 lions that had quickly risen to infamy as man-eaters at the time, violently and mercilessly killing and consuming an estimated 1,500 people during their reign of terror. These killings earned this pride the name, the man-eaters of Nyombe. Unlike the mysterious reasons behind why other lions turned to man-eating, this specific instance provided an obvious answer. The Rinderpest virus, which was responsible for killing livestock, caused the ruling British colonial government at the time to order the mass killings of wild zebras, antelopes, as well as wildebeest. And this was of course in an effort to control the outbreak, as they believed the virus had originated from what happened to be animals that were staples in the menu of most African lions. Due to the scarcity in their regular prey items, this particular pride of lions began making regular meals of humans in order to avoid starvation. Not to mention, the lions developed a clever scheme in order to avoid arousing human suspicion and would stealthily kill during the day instead of the night, in complete contradiction to their typical hunting schedules. We're talking about lions that get on a roof and dig people out. We're talking about lions that dig through a wall. We're not talking about just a regular old lion out there in the plains. It wasn't until the pride had claimed approximately 1,500 human lives that the lions were finally exterminated by the highly regarded at the time British game warden known as George Rushby, who had to furthermore overcome resistance of locals of the very same village from which the lions were hunting people. And the reason they resisted? The locals truly believed that killing the lions would be futile and would perhaps worsen the so-called curse that they believed was cast upon their village. As to them, these were no ordinary lions, but ones who were sent by an evil witch doctor to their village. In fact, most of Tanzania's man-eating lion cases were said to have stemmed from the belief that these were in fact spirit lions, or as the Savo Lions movie title suggested, the ghosts in the darkness. There are of course more rational explanations for these events as well. They're a force you have to deal with when you live around them. They're not evil. They're not spirit lions. They're not sent to avenge the sins of others. They're simply a very formidable animal. Although the man-eaters of Sabo and Nyombe may still be some of the more popular real-life accounts of man-eating lions, there are still countless of other killings that have gone unreported. Many of these attacks have occurred in rural areas where census numbers for such events are understandably left to speculation or approximations, as many of these attacks, once again, do not get reported. One such instance would most likely have also gone unreported, 
had inquisitive journalists from the National Geographic not covered the story at the time. It was April the 10th of 2008. Musafizi Shabami was cycling with his friend Muna not too far from home. But little did the two best friends know, a 140 kilogram lion had been stalking them as they were cycling. Just a regular old lion out there in the plains. The lion, it just came out from behind us and started chasing us. I was very scared. I was trembling so much I thought I was going to faint. The lion began chasing them while roaring at the same time, which is precisely when a traumatized Musafizi watched his friend get mauled and eaten by the lion as it sank his teeth into his neck, severing his spine in an instant and ending his life before it ravenously tore into his flesh before the eyes of his best friend. A horrified Musafizi then fled the scene as the lion consumed his friend. This incident has unsurprisingly deeply scarred Musafizi to this day. This is just one tragic case out of hundreds that occur each year in Tanzania, which involve lion attacks leading to human fatality. The fact that man-eating lions, if left undisturbed, commonly devour most of the vestige of their victims, including shoes, blood-soaked clothing, and their bones, all this only adds to the inaccuracy of the true number of victims that these man-eaters have, and sadly continue to claim to this day. In his book Death in a Tall Grass, Peter Capstick mentions that aside from the Savo and Nyombe man-eaters, there are literally dozens of lesser-known cases of man-eating lions, who he also said had without question claimed the lives of tens of thousands of people within the century alone. The Mpika lions, the Revugui man-eaters, and the Chambunqua lion, animals which Capstick had himself slain, were only just three of the estimated much higher number of man-eaters, some of which were never slain. And the sad reality is, the true number of these lions or their victims will most probably never be known. And when it came to killing these lions, this was by all accounts of course, no easy task, as the big cats became wary of hunters who were pursuing them and would cleverly avoid capture for many days until finally getting outsmarted and ultimately slain by a hunter. With all this in mind, it's also important to note that the numbers of African lions in the wild have dwindled significantly in comparison to what they were not too long ago, and the number of people that they have killed although they continue to rise and are higher than they ever were before, are still minute in comparison to the amount of their own that are slayed by the hands of humans. Many villagers living in lion territory believe that sometimes a life of one of their very own, as tragic as it may be, is the harsh price to pay for living amongst these formidable predators. And with more and more instances involving the loss of yet another loved one, some of these families, even as they mourn, innately have to accept the consequences of losing a loved one as a sort of tax they must pay for living in the land of a king. If you enjoy content like this, then be sure to check out our last episode featuring one of the most infamous tiger attacks in human history.